I'm Rob McNeil and I work for Fire Rescue New South Wales. I was lucky enough to um, lead the uh, Australian Task Force to the Japan Tsunami Search and Rescue Mission. And one thing <coughs> I just want everyone to make sure um, that I've got out of today was Kamina and Matilda. Um, your stories are so important because firefighters and emergency services around the world, they all learn from war stories and their stories and experiences from people. They're just so important and they're the real way that we go and learn. All right, let's see if we can make this work. All right, I'll just talk over this because um, it was about 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning, Saturday the 12th of March 2011, you never forget this, and um, I'd just come off my week of rotation on call. So I'd gone to Taronga Park Zoo, twilight there and listened to some musicians and had a few beers that night. And um, I saw this at 7 o'clock in the morning on my news and um, I was wondering to myself, I thought, well, fancy being the commander in charge of that response. And lo and behold, at 8.30 that morning, my commander rings me up, my deputy commissioner, and he says, how would you like to go off to Japan? Uh, and that's not really a question, that's more a directive, you know. In other words, pack your bags, you're off to Japan. I was taking my son Cooper to soccer. And um, this place here, Minamaya Sanriku, was actually where we did our search and rescue missions. And um, as you can see, and what astounded me, was the slow-moving nature of this disaster. And people just didn't move. They froze, as Commander tells us. And... Um, and that was the result. And just so powerful, it's just a, so, a powerful, slow-moving monster that just consumed everything and crushed and picked things up. Yeah. Um, so then the call come through. Another thing I want everyone to reflect on too here, because we have a group of people in the front, the future is behind us, and that group of people in the front is a great example of what a great country we live in. We have government from Mrs Bly on the right there to emergency service people in the front, people that are telling our stories and experts that give us the information to help manage emergency incidents. And I was lucky enough to see this work um, just so well where we brought together a response 10 hours away to a disastrous situation. Here we are, we have an urban search and rescue team which consists of 72 people and 20 tonne of equipment. Weeks before, that same team was in Christchurch, cutting through buildings and searching people for typical earthquake disasters with pancake constructions. Um, we'd had three responses to Christchurch and a previous response to the Queensland floods. And um, <clears throat> we had the resilience in our agency and it's the same in Queensland and around Australia to respond to the Japanese call for help. We knew it was bad when the Japanese called for help because they're a very proud nation and if they could have dealt with it on their own, they would have. So a team of 72 people, including doctors, paramedics, engineers, we had translators from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and our firefighters who do the search and rescue. Um, before we left, uh, we did what was called a risk assessment of where we arrived. So obviously the first risk in Japan was radiation because we knew that they had, I think, about 53 nuclear reactors in the coast and they were on the, on the east coast of Japan. So we had to make sure that our crews were safe from the threat of radiation. But what I didn't really factor in because I thought our capability is self... We can rely, we're self-reliant for 10 days is the fact that we had minus five degrees sleeping bags and the lowest temperature we got to was minus 17. So um, we, we were a little bit out there and it was quite cold every night. The journey to Japan um, was quite amazing. We managed to move together from that phone call at eight o'clock in the morning, considering the tsunami happened the previous afternoon, we were ready to go at Richmond Air Force Base at 6 o'clock Saturday night. We had some problems with getting a C-17 aircraft and there's our team of 72 firefighters, doctors, paramedics and engineers and search dogs in our C-17 aircraft 
travelling to um, Yukata Air Force Base, which is another great example of how our governments work together to create a capability to respond to help people. We were a state-based agency travelling on a national capability, the Australian Air Force, landing in a US Air Force base in Japan. And it all went together in 36 hours. We hit the ground at Yukata Air Force Base in 36 hours and then our real journey began. There's a firefighter up with his feet on the search dog cages. Um, one of the main things that struck me when I got to Yukata Air Force Base was that I need to keep this team together. And I suffered, one of the lessons I learnt, I suffered from becoming a dictator of a leader because I was so scared of what could happen to my team that I started to try and control everything. Now in our urban search and rescue teams, we have a structure that help us span our control across a workable number. And we believe that if you're in charge of between three to seven things, that that's your maximum span of control for critical, time-limited decision-making. And what I was trying to do was to control the whole lot because I was scared of what would happen and the overall um, impact of the situation was starting to give me decision paralysis. And I made one of those decisions. One of my team members came up to me with a New Zealand team leader and said, we have two Black Hawk helicopters. Let's go and fly and do a rec reconnaissance of the area, pick where we're going to put our base of operations and where we're going to search. And I said, fine, go. And we lost those four me members um, for, for 36 hours. That was my deputy team leader and my head paramedic in the ambulance service because they went and flew away. They couldn't get past Fukushima because of the um, terrible conditions. They were forced to do an um, emergency landing over Fukushima and they had to get their way back. Now, I don't know if anyone remembers the media reports of those days, but it was the Prime Minister reporting on firefighters that had been contaminated in Fukushima. And that was because I made that poor decision. There was no reason for us to get on those Black Hawk helicopters. I never asked whether we'll, we would make the flight, whether the weather conditions suited, and we were never going to pick where we were going to search. And um, so my objectives clearly weren't there. Then I was lucky enough to be able to communicate with one of my team members. And he came up to me and he said, Rob, you let us manage our span of control and you manage the strategic important things that you need to and everything will go fine. And from then on, it went a lot better because things are set up for a reason. And that's how it's structured. That's a boring part of it. And then came the next phase when I did make a good decision. I like this photo. It's, it's, I call it the bull pit. And um, this is clearly identified to me that you need to know why you are doing something. We went there quite prepared and knowing that we probably wouldn't be rescuing people. If you logically think about it, a tsunami inundates. Whereas where you have an earthquake, and you have collapse, you can rescue people because they could be in voids. But in a tsunami earthquake, those voids have been filled up with water. So your chance of surviving, anyone surviving is nil, or very little unless they're on the roof of something. And it was minus 17 degrees and it took us 48 hours to get there, so there's probably no chance of anyone surviving. The other urban search and rescue teams came to rescue. So our reason, why did we go there? And it was, this was clearly, in my mind, was we were there to give humanitarian aid to the Japanese. And that didn't matter if we just held their hand for the next two days, because that's what they needed. When we arrived at our base of operations in Tomei City, up above from um, Minamai Sanriku, which was one of the worst devastated areas of the tsunami, I was met with four other urban search and rescue teams that told us we all had to get out of there, we were going to die from um, radiation poisoning. And they had the maps up on the wall, they worked it out, and I thought to myself, I thought, well, Swedes, Germans, they're all experts in nuclear power plants, what do we know? I had a very good network of experts back in Australia. As we got lectures from the people from the Bureau and the Geoscience, we had people from ANSTO and from the nuclear facilities in Australia 
that were advising us. And the stories here weren't marrying up with the stories I was getting from our network of experts back in Australia. They believed they were going to rescue no one and they didn't come with the same reasons that I did. Or, well, our team did, sorry. And that was to give humanitarian aid to the Japanese. They left and one of the funniest things I look back and laugh on is as one of the teams was leaving, they said to me, they said, can we have your trucks? Because we had to borrow trucks all the way up to get where we were because there was nothing in Japan. There was no power, there was no water, there was no diesel fuel. So everywhere we went, we had to go and we had to barter for it. And we got it and I thought, geez, will I give them my trucks? And someone whispered in my ear, they said, you're not going to keep them anyway because all the drivers are going to go back to the next job. I went, OK, so we gave them our trucks and, the, and they were gone within that day. And we stayed on. We had to commandeer buses and trucks, as you can see the buses in the background, and that's how we transferred around Japan to get to our journey, our, our base of operations in Tomei City. And when we got there, the conditions, everything was difficult. Every night it was snowing, and one of the things that struck me was the first time I went down to the waterfront, it just looked like a rubbish tip. And the next day when we went down, it was like a winter wonderland. The snow had come down to the ocean um, and it was just beautiful. But that made our, our search and rescue mission or our search mission so much more difficult because everything was wet, muddy, slushy and freezing cold. There's just an example of some of the conditions that we went through. And up there on um, your top left hand corner, that was an, uh, an amazing story of an amazing man named Jin Sato who was the mayor of Minamai Senruku. And Jin Sato worked in the emergency services building. And that building up there on the left hand side is a building that is tsunami proof according to the construction. Yes, the main structure of the building was still standing, but everything had been dragged through it and it acted like a tea strainer. And that's where Jin Sato, who was still the incident controller of that incident, when the waves came through, when the tsunami came through, he was hanging to the roof of the, the tower, in the communications tower. And um, he stayed on. When I came back six weeks later, he was still there as the incident controller. Quite an amazing man. I was lucky enough to have him back in Australia and uh, meet up with him and share dinner. Um, the conditions our firefighters worked in were, um, very, were atrocious. Um, we had the, the, the worry of biological contamination, radiation contamination, asbestos contamination. Um, but they soldiered on because, and I believe, because they were there to give humanitarian aid to the Japanese. And that's why it's so important to know why you were doing what you were doing. And one of the um, amazing things was every now and then you would just get an image of survival. And I can remember two very clear images of survival. One was that teddy bear there, and it's your team members that pick these up and give them to you. And another was a trumpet that was in a, in a case that was in immaculate condition. And, um, and yeah, it, that to me I believe that is a message that tells you what you're doing is there is always hope at the end of the line. And yes, and, and the team really did push themselves to doing some incredible searches, um, albeit the searches were probably in vain because we realised that we would find no living victims, but it did send a clear message to the Japanese that they were being supported internationally. Another clear picture to me that I, I ponder over was, it was like Mother Nature picked up everything out of the sea and threw it on land. And here we see the fishing nets and the boys. On top of the buildings, the four-storey buildings, we found fish and very large prawns that were just thrown up on top of the, on top of the buildings. And um, we took note. That's the inside of um, Minamai Senriku four-storey hospital. Um, that's how we used to go around and just try and get trucks and equipment to um, search our gear. Sorry. Um, that's one of our dogs and our search dogs and they're live victim located dogs and you've got a feel for our dogs. They just come back from Christchurch 
And the dogs, during their whole search, their live victim locator dogs, they never found a live victim. So really, um, yes, and so they were losing their skill. And that's Minimai Sanriku. That's where you saw the wave come through at the start of the, the um, presentation. There's the hospital. And there is the emergency services building. And um, within four days of search and rescue, our Australian team searched hundreds of cars and four square kilometres of area and all the buildings in the area. When I was talking about governments and how lucky we are to have the governments that network like we're networking today and the expert panel of people and the people that tell our stories is that here is one of my search, has search technicians. Um, he's also an ex-SAS soldier and um, he was picking up one of the dogs to pass him through a hole to do a search and the dog turned around and bit him on the face. You shouldn't touch a dog that's not your, you're not handling. And so anyway, it tore him right through and ripped right through his, his upper lip in two places. So it reminded me of MASH. I don't know, a lot of you people wouldn't know the TV series MASH. But um, I was in the tent with the doctor and I said to the doctor, how do we get him back to our work to pre-injury conditions? And um, the doctor said, find a plastic surgeon. I said, well, that'll be impossible. Next thing you know, we've made a phone call to the Australian Defence Force we had a US aircraft carrier off the coast that flew a, that helicopter there to pick him up at our base of operations, who flew him down to Yokota Air Force Base, who knocked on the door of a plastic surgeon at 2 o'clock in the morning, and in 36 hours he was, he was eating hamburgers. <laughs> we had many risks. One, and this is one of my last quick stories I'll tell you, would be after my first 48 hours of being in Japan, I thought I'd sleep for a couple of hours, crawled into my tent, and there are our tents in the middle there, and next thing you know, the ground started to shake. It was 6.3, I think, magnitude earthquake, or after tremor, whatever the experts call it. And um, I thought, oh, lucky we camped here on a baseball field. And then I thought, well, just say the ground opens up and swallows me up. But it was terrifying. After about three days there, we had numerous hundreds of them, and you became used to it. Um, radiation, we monitored for radiation the whole time. And after that earthquake, I thought, well, just say another tsunami comes. I know that's not the way it technically works now, but we made sure our base of operations was up high and that we had escape routes through to the highest location that we could find. There's our evacuation route to the top of the old hospital building. And we continually had linked back to our experts who told us where the radiation plume was going and who also could send us information about where destroyed roads were. We had our own satellite system set up and we were getting this data constantly so that we could make informed decisions. Oops. Um, just some pictures, little things you learn along the way. When we search a car, or any area, we usually mark it so it's searched, so we don't go back and search the same area again. But when it's snowing and raining and wet, it doesn't work because the paint runs. So that's just a simple thing. Another thing is when your tents are um, covered in snow and your boots are all wet, it helps to have an area to get changed so that you're not getting the mud inside your tent. And you just don't have to take your boots off and stick your bum in the tent and then roll in and then they're frozen in the morning. Everywhere we went, we were tested for radiation contamination. The site got very slushy. We decontaminated our own people. We had to do a lot of critical incident debriefing because the, t the teams did see death. Um, and that's just an example of the tendonitis that our people got in their hands because it was a very unusual type of rescue operation where we were pulling debris out of, um, out of sites instead of cutting concrete and lifting with hydraulic tools. One of the biggest things that I really didn't realise when I took off was by going there, knowing why we were going there and giving support to the Japanese is the incredible close bond that that gave us with that country from then on. Just the sheer fact that we went and we supported them and we stayed with them for as long as we want. When I met with the commander, I said, we're here for as long as you want. We've got 10 days of survivability. And after that, we'll send another team if you still want us. And um, 
and, and on the 19th of March, they said, we don't want you anymore, and we packed up and we went home because they realised then that there was no one left to survive and they, they got themselves in a position where they could continue on. And another thing that I learned there was ceremonies are very important. As we left, we met with the other fire commanders, we paid our respects, we gave them a gift and we left. And that's just a slide to show you that the, um, the international relationships that were, that were gained by doing exactly what we did under the powers of the people in this room as a wider audience um, were very, very, yeah, were incredible. <laughs>